crystal structure um, in the Yakima Canyon and in the Saddle Mountains Fault and Decline. Uh, both of these are Yakima fold structures. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different techniques that we've used, so I'll try and go through them and explain them um, and what they tell us and how they tell us about um, crustal structure and deformation rates. So I do want to put a big thank you to all of my co-authors, Rick Blakely, Harvey Kelsey, Brian Sherrod, and Richard Styron. Um, they helped me a lot with uh, all the different types of analyses that we did for this work. Um, and so the uh, this picture here is showing a view of um, some of the tilted Columbia River flood basalt with the Yakima Canyon below, looking south into Sela Butte or into the Sela Valley. Um, and I was on top of uh, the Sela Butte anticline at this spot. So here, I thought we'd start out with just a general idea of what's going on in the Pacific Northwest, uh, deformation-wise. So this is an image showing uh, GPS vectors from uh, Rob McCaffrey's work in 2013 and 2016, showing this really broad uh, clockwise rotation that we have in um, the Pacific Northwest. This clockwise rotation is thought to be due to oblique subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate. And I hope you guys can see my pointer. Does that, does that show up? Nods. OK, great. And also Northwest translation. The is, you're not, you're Join not. the meeting. The Yakima Folds, they're located in the back arc highlighted in this yellow area here. here. And we've got north-south shortening. Um, uh, based on the geodetic rate, it seems to be about two millimeters per year across this broad region, accommodated along the folds and faults there. It's a fairly slow strain environment. And so identifying individual fault slip rates and fault deformation rates from the GPS is really quite difficult. So we turn to geology, geophysics, and uh, geomorphology to answer those questions. Here now I'm showing a um, sort of a, a blow up of that area. These are the Yakima folds, these beautiful east-west structures, which you can see quite clearly in the topography. And, uh, but before these uh, faults really started um, creating this topography, there was quite a bit of basalt erupted during the Columbia River flood basalt period across this landscape. It blanketed the landscape, filled in a lot of the paleo topography. So we can think of this region having been a very subtle or low topography set to sort of a, a tabula rasa about uh, 15 to or 17 to 10 million years ago by those flood basalts. That means that a lot of the modern topography that we see today in this beautiful hill shape map um, along the Yakima folds represents post midmycene deformation. Here I'll overlay some of the, some of the seismicity in the region. Uh, the seismicity is typically uh, uh, characterized by small uh, distributed earthquakes um, within the region, clustering in some near some of these faults, but generally pretty distributed. This is a region in which we, we do know that there have been some large magnitude earthquakes. Um, this cluster up here is located near the epicenter of the 1872 Antioch earthquake, which was perhaps magnitude 6.7, something like that. The geology of the area is typically that of Columbia River flood basalts everywhere with a thin Pliocene to Quaternary cover, which is this yellow material here. This uh, cover is typically, again, thin and laterally discontinuous. So using it um, and its stratigraphy for understanding deformation rates is not always possible when it's absent or, or very thin. I'm going to be focusing first on uh, some work we did in the Yakima Canyon region here. So the Yakima River, it's flowing south through the Tass Valley, through these beautiful faults and folds, and into the Sela Valley over here. So I'll, oops, no, not yet. I won't focus into that map yet. So the goals of uh, our study in the Yakima Canyon region were to constrain the fault deformation on individual fault zones. So there's a Menashe Shash Ridge here the Umtanum Ridge here, and then there's a Sea Butte anticline in this region as well, and to assess fault geometry at depth. Uh, slip rates and fault geometry are, are really uh, primary constraints in seismic hazard analysis, so having them on, on individual faults is, is pretty important. The methods that we focused on were uh, using balanced cross sections, and this was to uh, get at what the fault geometries look like at depth, what the crustal structure looks like, and to understand long-term deformation. So basically deformation since mid in time. We also um, use stream profile analysis, which is a way of reading the geomorphic character of the topography 
to get a relatively continuous uh, record of uh, rock uplift rates. And we designed this in a way to uh, identify fault, fault uplift rates on individual structures in this region. So those are the two main methods uh, for this Yakima Canyon study. There are some really important initial constraints um, that we'll use to verify our um, stream profile analysis. One comes from the Pliocene Thorpe gravels. This is a picture from Potato Hill located right here in Pass Valley. These nice gravel sequence. It's been dated using cosmogenic burial dating and uh, 2.9 million years. And in other places, it's estimated to be uh, younger than 3.7 million years from uh, zircon fission track analyses. So this Pliocene gravel, we find it, and I've highlighted where it's located in pink here. Um, we find it in the Kittitas Valley at about 450 meters elevation. And we find it at a similar elevation in the Sela Valley. So that indicates to us that there's relatively little or no differential uplift between these two valleys or of these two valleys relative to each other since Pliocene time. But we have these Thorpe gravels um, mapped up here in the Sela Creek catchment. This is on the Yakima Training Center landscape. Um, and they've been uplifted since Pliocene time by about 290 meters. So this is a really important strain marker for us to use. Some of the other data sets that we have already in the region was some work done by Adrian Bender and colleagues uh, dating um, incised strath terraces. So the location of these strath terraces are uh, from north to south, uh, colored blue to red, that's, that's these dots here. This is a picture with Colin Amos uh, standing atop one of the ridges and across the river, we can see this nice strath terrace here. So strath terraces are typically uh, gravel or, or fluvial material that is deposited on top of what was the river bed at the time that they were deposited. So by getting the age of a deposit and measuring its elevation above the active river, this gives us an idea of incision rate. So using the cosmogenic burial ages from those, all these different strath terraces and their elevation above the river, um, Adrian and others were able to estimate incision rates and how they change along the canyon. So from blue, blue to red, we're going north to south. So north is blue, south is red. And I've color coded these here too. So here's north, Kittitas Valley. Here's south approaching Seal Butte Anticline. And importantly, what we can see is that these incision rates increase towards anticlinal crests, which means they've been relatively recently active. And that deformation is mostly accommodated near those anticlines. So that makes sense. Um, and those are also going to be important constraints for us. So the two cross sections that I've created, uh, this is now a, a more detailed geologic map of the Yakima Canyon region, are from um, A to A prime. And this cross section was developed to capture the deformation across the region. And then B to B prime is a shorter cross section that was specifically um, focused on trying to figure out sort of what's going on with the sea Butte anticline and what that structure looks like at depth and whether or not it's related to some of the other structures in the region. So the constraints that come that we use to uh, create these balanced cross sections come from the bedrock geology, this more detailed geology here, uh, from bedding orientations. So you can see some strike and dip markers here with numbers indicating the dip of the basaltic units. And um, stratigraphy, which is generally from nearby boreholes, there's one located here and a couple scattered around that we used as um, helpful constraints. And one of the other really incredible data sets that we have in this region are uh, gravity and magnetic, magnetic anomalies. So here is a map showing magnetic anomalies in the region. So these are aeromagnetic, fairly high resolution aeromagnetic anomalies. Um, and what's useful about these is that here in this landscape, we have a lot of strongly magnetic basalt. And the Columbia River flood basalts flows have different magnetic properties depending on when they were cooled, at what time, and what the magnetic field was like um, over the, the you know, 17 to 10 million years ago that they were being erupted. And so what that means is that uh, when you have a fault defold, uh, folding and deforming the, the strata and juxtaposing um, different uh, basalt units of, different, of variable ma magnetic properties next to each other, then, then that really shows up in the, um, in the aeromag. So you can see there's some really strong gradients near where these faults and folds are. What we can do, sorry, if you can hear my dogs barking in the background, I guess. 
I guess the Amazon guy came by. Um, <clears throat> anyways, what this, uh, what this is useful for is that we can forward model the magnetic anomalies from our cross sections and, um, and try and best match the measured magnetic anomalies that are seen in this, um, along these transects. The gravity anomalies I'm showing here with um, higher magnetic or habit higher anomalies in um, in pinker tones and, and lower what color what is my color scheme sorry okay low low is in pink and then getting into blues and greens are, are higher anomalies and uh, what's useful with gravity is that it's fairly sensitive to upper crustal and basement structure because what we're reading is density contrast between the, um, the thick Columbia River flood basalts, which are fairly dense, the underlying sedimentary strata, which are Eocene and Oligocene in age. And then again, we have another dense layer of uh, basement rock below. So these are the two cross sections, A to A prime. So this is Ketitas Valley here and Sela Valley in the south here. And this is B to B prime going across the Sela Butte and decline. So these are the cross sections in the bottom. These are the, the, the final cross section results. And basically what I've done is I've taken all these different geologic units, um, matched them to the surface geology that we see at the surface and uh, the dips of the different beds at the surface. Um, there are some borehole locations here as these blue lines over here. These were helpful at characterizing sort of where we get into the underlying sedimentary units. So these, this is CRB is from this dark purple and above. And this Pliocene cover is um, in the yellow. And basement rock here is in purple. So what we can do is we can input um, estimates of the magnetic properties of these different units um, and try and best match the magnetic anomalies that are measured. So on these two top graphs here, what I'm showing are observed magnetic anomalies in blue, light blue, and the calculated magnetic anomalies from the cross sections in dark blue. And so you can overall see that there's a pretty good match here. There's one spot where it doesn't match particularly well, and that's right here. This is where our cross section actually transects the Yakima Canyon. And this is a location where the magnetic anomalies uh, are measured a little bit higher above the topography because the plane measuring the anomalies couldn't just dive into the canyon. And so that mismatch between the model and the measured anomaly is actually fairly expected. Um, in pink right down here, these two graphs I'm showing uh, the observed gravity anomalies in this sort of light pink mauve color, and then the calculated um, calculated gravity anomalies in darker pink. So here we also have a pretty good mismatch or a pretty good match between observed and modeled um, anomalies. And this is again formed by uh, density contrasts in the dense basalt, the slightly less dense underlying Eocene and Oligocene strata, and then the once again dense basement beneath that. The results from these cross sections show that across the Yakima Canyon region, we're getting about three and a half kilometers of shortening over Miocene to modern time. It's about 10%. It's not a ton, but it's, it's definitely there. How this is partitioned along uh, individual anticlines is that the Menashe Ridge fault system has taken up about 1.1 kilometers of shortening, and the Umtenum Ridge anticline system has taken up about 2.4, so it's a bit more major. Um, when we look at the Sela Butte anticline, we find that it looks like to be uh, an ancillary back thrust to the um, Umtanum Ridge system, and that the Umtanum fault here is uh, taking up a little bit less, 1.6 kilometers estimated across this region, but it's also steeper. Um, one of the things I also want to draw out is that, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of blow up this, this part of the graph here, is that we actually modeled the gravity anomalies in two different ways. One was to include uh, fairly major basement topography, and the other was to uh, just er keep it at a fairly consistent level so that that purple layer wouldn't be so bumpy. And what we found is that um, the gravity anomalies, when measured or when estimated without major basement topography, are this dotted line here. They really don't match that, the measurements at all. So what that tells us is that the basement topography is fairly essential for explaining the um, gravity anomalies in this region. Uh, zooming out a little bit more, um, this is what those gravity anomalies uh, or those basement uh, topography uh, would look like without uh, th th that's required to generate that uh, gravity anomaly data set. I'm at a slightly higher vertical exaggeration here. So it's 
these are all ba basically twice as steep as they, they would be in reality in this cross section. So the detailed cross section was in this region, but we modeled it out a little bit further to look at the basement topography at depth. Um, and when we looked at it, we thought that, you know, it actually kind of looked like this basement topography was perhaps normally faulted, um, which actually makes sense with some of what we know of Eocene tectonics in other places of uh, central Washington. So Eocene uh, time periods in central Washington, there's also uh, other evidence for um, a normal faulting and dike intrusion uh, documented elsewhere. And so we think that initially there was some, uh, some uh, tension or transtension within central Washington region in Eocene and earlier time periods. And that sometime later, um, perhaps in the Oligocene, uh, the tectonics in this region was inverted and became a one of um, compression or transpression. Um, and so that later these normal faults were inverted to become the, the uh, reverse faults that we see today. So just to quickly summarize, <clears throat> the cross sections are showing about 3.5 kilometers of shortening um, across the region. On the individual structures, we can estimate the amount of uplift. So about 0.5 kilometers of uplift since mid Miocene time on the, along the Menashe Ridge and about 0.66 kilometers on the Umtana Ridge. These are going to be important values for later. So just keep those in mind. And then uh, from the Eocene and Oligocene units, we also saw that those perhaps had experienced a bit more shortening prior to the Miocene basalt eruption. So we think that shortening started sometime before the CRB erupted. Um, from the basement topography, uh, we suggest that there was an earlier phase of normal faulting and that it was uh, later inverted to become trans uh, or compressional or transpressional sometime in the Oligocene perhaps. Okay, now I'm going to shift, uh, shift subjects quite a bit. So one of the other types of analyses that we did on uh, the Yakima Canyon reason was to look at stream profile inversion. This is a way of reading the geomorphic signature of the rivers to see if we can tell something about uplift rate. So on uh, these graphs here, what I'm showing is elevation for these uh, sort of simplified theoretical rivers and distance from mouth. So stream profile inversion largely relies on a power law relationship between channel slope, which is this parameter here, slope, um, and its relationship with the upstream drainage area. And there's a couple other important parameters. One is concavity, so how sort of scoop-shaped is the river, and uh, this important uh, measurement of steepness, which is not quite slope, it's a little bit different. So in this, two, this example here, I'm showing two rivers that have the same up uh, stream drainage area and the same concavity. Um, and you can plot them like this in which the, the, the blue one's a bit steeper. And when you transform this, um, uh, this graph into a log slope versus log area, you get um, these two lines. And where this line intersects tells us about the steepness right here. So the blue line, its intercept is going to be higher. So its steepness is higher than the red one. So that's more or less what the equation looks like graphically. The steepness value, it's important, and we care about it because it is related to erodibility of the rock. So soft rock is more erodible, of course, and moves a bit faster down slope. Down slope. Um, and it's related to uplift rate um, in a uh, equilibrium landscape. So that top one is an example of comparing two different rivers to each other. But what if we see a change in steepness along one river by itself? So this is an example in which we would see a rarely slow slope um, in upper reaches of a drainage area, and that the lower slope is equilibrated to a faster uplift rate. The region in between is something that we call a nick point. So in KS space or log S versus log A space, this blue uh, line here, it, it's projected, um, um, what do you call it? Intercept is a bit higher. So the steepness of this section of the river is higher. So again, the steepness is dependent on the uplift rate and erodibility of the landscape. So we're going to use those equations and look at some of the rivers that we have in the Yakima Canyon. First, I wanted to give you a little bit of primer on the two end member scenarios. So uplift rates could vary over time, or they could vary over space. Um, if the change, if an uplift uh, rate is variant over space, like if you have a fault, then that nick point could perhaps be the location in which you have different uplift rates on different sides of a, of a tectonic structure. 
The other end member scenario is that uplift rate changes over time. And in this is sort of this right diagram here in which a former slope profile is equilibrated to a lower rate of uplift. If, for example, the uplift rate increased, then the lower reaches of the stream would slowly start equilibrating to that higher rate of uplift where, where the steepness of this lower portion is, is faster. This nick point would therefore be recording the time at which uh, we had seen that, experienced that change in uplift rate. <clears throat> so when we look at the actual uh, little streams and rivers coming off of these individual structures in the Yakum Canyon, we do see some uh, non-equilibrium uh, or not fully um, equilibrated rivers. Basically, we're seeing a, a bunch of changes in steepness. So these are derived from some of the rivers um, and two, two meter LIDAR digital elevation models. So we've got the Sela Creek here, the Umtanum Creek here, and Burbank Creek here. We find nick points in these trunk streams, like this one here. This one's a really nice strong one. And we also find them in the, um, the tributaries to these streams. When we look at them and compare them to map structures, we don't see that they correlate very well, which suggests to us that the lower reaches a lot of these streams in the Yakima Canyon region uh, appear to be graded to a faster rate of incision and uplift in the landscape. So now the important questions, of course, are what are those rates of uplift and when did they change? So using those uh, equations that I showed earlier, and transforming uh, the uh, geomorphology that we have from the high resolution LIDAR imagery, we're able to come up with um, some results that would more or less give us in, in sort of conceptual view, um, a uh, estimate of uplift rate and how it changes over time. So basically the, the higher you fall, climb up into the catchment, the farther back in time you go. And the product is a more or less continuous record of relative rock uplift. So here now are some of the results. We've got the Menashtash Ridge anticline, the Umkana Ridge anticline, and the Sila Butte anticline. These are all derived from rivers that are, uh, and little streams that are draining these structures in the Yakima um, province. On the y-axis, I have a relative rock uplift rate from zero to 0.5 millimeters per year. And on the bottom is time, channel response time, from present day to 10 million years. So from our results, we're estimating that we can get a relatively rec continuous record of rock uplift rate over the past 6.5 million years in this uh, Umtanum Ridge re region. In Sela Butte, we're getting only about 3 million years worth of time because this, the streams are shorter, so they don't record as much sort of incision and uplift history. Um, from the Menasha region and the Umtanum Ridge, we see that uh, the relative rock uplift rate, rate has been relatively steady from about 6.5 to 2 million years ago but that there's a pretty dramatic inflection about two to maybe one and a half million years ago in which rock uplift rate perhaps increased quite a bit. These are model results. And so we do have to ask how realistic are these estimates? These models have to be tested. Luckily, we have some geologic data to compare to. Um, and so on the next slide, what I'm gonna be showing is basically the same results from the stream profile model, but instead of uh, uh, having relative rock uplift rate, I'm going to transform this into cumulative uplift. So this is sort of the uplift derived from those uplift rates over time from our stream profile analysis. And why I've, I'm showing this instead is because cumulative uplift rate is a lot more, or cumulative uplift rather, it's a lot more comparable of a metric to geologic data sets. For example, we have the Thorpe gravels, um, which again have been uplifted 2 .9, or, uh, 290 meters over the past 2.9 million years. And so we find those in the Sealy Creek catchment that's sort of in between the Umtanum Ridge and the Sealy Butte anticline. When we compare that amount of uplift over the past 2.9 million years, you can see that, that that quantity is actually very similar to our model results. So that's giving us an idea that we are within the right ballpark with our um, stream profile model results. We can also compare um, this cumulative uplift with the amount we estimate from uh, the cross-sections from the long-term geologic history. So again, from the Menashash Ridge, our cross-sections suggest that there's been about 0.5 kilometers of uplift along the Menashash Ridge endocline. It's a little bit more than our stream profile, close to within uncertainty, but it's a little bit more. To that, to me, that suggests that the stream profile analysis isn't capturing quite the full history of uplift along that endocline, 
and that there was perhaps a, an earlier phase in which there was maybe about 100 meters of uplift before we the rivers really started, um, or the rivers that we see today could really record that, that rate. The Umtenum Ridge and decline from our cross section was um, accommodating about 0.65 kilometers of uplift. And that's really close, certainly with an uncertainty of what we're seeing in the stream profile analysis. These rivers are longer again, so they record more time. So I think we're capturing almost all of the uplift history from the stream profile analysis along Umtenum Ridge. <clears throat> So now that we've more or less verified that our model results are pretty close to what we see in the, geolog in the geology, um, we can report what recent uplift rates have been like and try and transform this into slip rates. So along the Manashash Ridge, Umtana Ridge, and Seal Butte end declines, the relatively recent uh, rock uplift rates from this um, analysis over the past 100 or 200,000 years are about 0.15 to 0.5 or 0.17 millimeters per year. Um, we're not going to use the seal of one because again, it's an ancillary back for us. So detangling its uplift history from the whole system of the Umtana Ridge is pretty difficult. So I'm not going to give a slip rate estimate for the seal of anticline. I think it would be a little bit uh, dishonest. Um, so what, but what we can do is uh, using the fault geometries from our cross sections and using these rates of uplift, we can estimate that there's a fairly recent slip rate along the Manash Shash Ridge and decline of about 0 0 0.35 millimeters per year. And along the Umtana Ridge and decline between about 0.5 to perhaps about 0.64 millimeters per year. If you add those two together, we get 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 millimeters per year. That's nearly half the geodetic rate across the Yakima folds accommodated along these two structures. So that seems to me that it's, it's accommodating a lot of the modern deformation that we see today, but it's only half. So there are other important structures in this region that are accommodating shortening too. So I think that these are fairly major structures, but not the whole story. Okay, so we're seeing this Pliocene or Pleistocene rate increase in the Yakima folds in the Yakima Canyon region, but is this a localized event or is it more widespread? I think it actually might be more widespread. We have done another analysis over here in the Saddle Mountains and decline. And uh, from uh, deformation of the Saddle Mountains and decline and its relationship and what we can read from the Ringgold uh, strata, um, which is a uh, growth strata in this region, it seems to suggest that there was an acceleration sometime after 6.8 million years. So I'll go into the de data details of how we generate that number. Here's one of my favorite views of the Saddle Mountains and decline where I don't know if you can see this difference between basalt on one side and wrinkled strata on the other side, but there's a nice fault exposure along the Saddle Mountains and decline over here in which we have the lower wrinkled formation, which are growth strata, and the upper wrinkled formation, which are lacustrine strata in this region. So here now is a map of the, um, of the uh, <clears throat> Saddle Mountains and decline region. It's a um, North Virgin thrust fault. And uh, we focused our work here to constrain, again, deformation rates, rate changes, and structure depth. There is some previous cool work on uh, a seismic line and interpretation of fault geometry at depth by Casale and Pratt. The seismic line goes right through it. And there's some uh, really high, high quality geologic mapping by Steve Rydell that was published in 1984. There's some nice boreholes nearby, these little white dots, and some paleoseismic trenches that were located just around here. Um, along the fault exposures of the Saddle Mountains Fault. The new constraints that we have come from uh, the growth strata in, of the Ringgold Formation, um, where we've uh, dated uranium lead ages from zircons um, to get at the timing of, um, of deformation and of deposition, and some U-series analysis, which is uh, dating some deformed caliche units. And we also have a couple of geologic cross sections. I'm not going to show the, the, uh, the geologic cross section specifically, but I'm happy to share that data later. <clears throat> um, the wrinkled formation, we find it not just on the foot wall side of the Saddle Mountains and Decline, but we find just a little bit highlighted in pink here in the hanging wall too. And so what the foot wall stratigraphy looks like is like this. Here's Harvey Kelsey for scale. So it's um, about a little bit over 100 meters thick. It's uh, the lower portion is dominated by mud flows and debris flows. There's some tephra that we've dated and a few fluvial layers as well. Um, and it's all capped by this channel fill strata. I'll show a picture of that later. And that's, that's a really important thing that we found. And then 
Above the lower wrinkle formation in the foot wall, we also see this shallow lacustrian strata. And there's occasional paleosols and mudflows too, but it's, it's pretty fine material. So you get a pretty big change in, um, in the sort of depositional system. In the hanging wall, uh, there are some similarities and some differences. It's much thinner for one. Here's one of the thicker sections of it with Scott Bennett for scale on the top here. Um, we see the lower thingle, wrinkled strata here, again, dominated by mud flows and debris flows, uh, one tephra that we've sampled and dated, and a couple more sandstones. And it's capped by this fluvial chanophyll strata, again. Um, and you can see it sort of here, it's this nice gray unit. And then there's some caliche and paleosol material right on top. A pretty impressive caliche, I'd say. Um, importantly, the upper ringle formation here is absent. We don't see that shallow lacustrian strata in the hanging wall. So those caliche layers, um, I mentioned on the hang wall, they are deformed. And so here's a nice picture of the steeply dipping caliche layers with Lydia's dog for scale. It's my dog, Yura. Um, and so we sampled this material because we wanted to figure out, you know, when it, when it was deformed, you know, how old is this caliche? So we, we sampled the uppermost petrocalcic horizon, both in the hanging wall and in the foot wall. The hanging wall was deformed like this. And the foot wall at the site of collection was not deformed, but it was found to be deformed in a nearby paleoseismic trench. So the idea here is that if we can date the timing that this caliche material was formed, it gives us a maximum estimate of when deformation happened. So the deformation happened after calcification. <clears throat> so this is sort of the overall data set that we've generated uh, for the stratigraphy in the um, Saddam Mountains Fault region uh, for the ringle formation. We've got two strat columns on the foot wall and four on the hanging wall. We've got the tephra samples located at these uh, yellow dots throughout the stratigraphy here. We've got some provenance samples. I'm not going to be talking about them in this talk, but they have their own very cool story associated with them. And um, the U-series dates that we got for those caliche layers come from where these uh, green triangles are here and here. And importantly, we were also able to identify two marker beds. One comes from the 10 million year old elephant mountain basalt. That is meter zero of all these strat columns here. And then that correlated strata, that chenophyll unit that we find is fairly unique and both on the hanging wall and the foot wall um, gives us an idea of uh, when those layers were at the same level because now they're quite a bit more uplifted. And so that's an important uh, marker bed for us uh, for our strain estimate as well. So here first are the tougher results. I'm, I'm showing some of the LAICPMS zircon ages from the, um, the foot wall, going from the oldest to youngest. And they're plotted here um, with age going from zero to 10 million years on the x-axis and stratigraphic height above the elephant mountain basalt, so basically where they are in the stratigraphy um, on the y-axis. The one we dated from the hanging wall was uh, near the base of the section and nine and a half million years old. And it's very, very similar in age to the lowermost foot wall. Uh, one that we collected, which is also 9.51 million years. They had basically the same age, which is good. Um, and the other tephra that we dated were um, 8 million years, 7.3 million years, and 3.5 million years in age. Um, it turned out that these were very helpful for estimating the age of that marker bed, because not only are they you know, in stratigraphic order, which you always like to see, um, but also they uh, form a fairly linear trend. So it's a fairly linear sedimentation rate going on here. So using a pretty standard uh, linear regression, we were able to estimate the age of that marker bed because we knew how high it was above the um, elephant mountain basalt. And so we estimate that it's about 6.8 million years old. The UCS results are shown here. So there's two populations. Um, in the hanging wall caliche. So hanging wall samples like I'm showing in blue on this diagram. The estimated age from U-series analysis are along these sort of diagonal lines. So this is 100,000 years, 150,000 years, and so on. So the two populations, so you can sort of, so you sort of see two clouds here in the blue dots. Um, we see one population that's about 200 to 400,000 years in the hanging wall here, and another population of ages around 90 to 100,000 years here. This gives us an idea that tilting happened probably sometime after 200,000 years, but the age of the, the exact age of this deformed caliche was kind of hard to pin down. 
So we'll be conservative and say that it happened sometime after 200,000 years. Um, in the foot wall, we had that um, caliche that was not deformed at the site of collection, but correlated to an, in a nearby trench. And they form a pretty nice, nicely along the similar line, estimating uh, the age of calcification around 153,000 years ago. So that suggests to us that deformation of the nearby trench occurred at least after that time. So I'll try to construct um, Pelia relief and uplift rates along the Saddle Mountains and decline using the stratigraphy that we have from the Ringgold. So here are some little diagrams of what we think happened over time. So we have the onset of Ringgold deposition along the Saddle Mountains and decline indicated by that first tephra sometime between 10 to 9.5 million years ago. So pretty soon after the Elephant Mountain basalt, which is about 10 to 10.5 million MA. And um, over the phase for the next um, 9.5 to 6.8 million years, we estimate that there were tens of meters of uplift. And we estimate that because we know the relative difference in stratigraphic thickness from the foot wall starting at 9.5 to 6.8 MA. That's a, that mark, channel fill marker. And we know that it's a, bit, a lot thicker in the foot wall than it is in the hanging wall. And so we can say that there were several, you know, dozens of meters of uplift over three to four million years. After that time though, we get a lot more offset. The 6.8 million year old marker is quite a bit more offset by hundreds of meters, um, not just tens of meters. And so that indicates to us that there may have been a rapid increase in the rate of deformation accommodated along the Saddle Mountains Fault that happened sometime after 6.8. We can't exactly say when. We think it was actually a little bit more recent from some other data sets. Um, and some additional information for that is that we see that there is um, lake and paleosol uh, deposition on just the foot wall. We don't see it on the hanging wall. So there was at least enough uh, deformation accommodated along the Saddle Mountains Fault system to isolate the hanging wall above the lake um, when it was being deposited. So taking the estimates of rock that both rate from this time period between 9.5 to 6.8 and then after 6.8, we estimate that there is at least a five-fold increase in the rock uplift rate. We can use the fault geometries uh, from the local cross sections. I'm not showing them here, but I'm happy to show them later to estimate slip rates. And we're estimating them uh, to be about 0.12 to 0.18 millimeters per year six, since 6.8 million years ago. That is a minimum, again, because that rate increase could have happened later. We don't know exactly when. Um, so it could be a little bit faster, actually. OK. So shifting into some ideas of what we think about strain rate um, and deformation and earthquake hazards in, in the um, Yakima Fold province, one of the things we can do is use uh, some equations for um, that are pretty typical in seismic hazard analysis to estimate how long does it take, so time, to create an earthquake of a particular magnitude. This is an equation in which um, some of the information that we were able to add includes fault dip uh, angle from our cross sections and slip rates from our other analyses as well. And so uh, the results for um, plugging our numbers into this sort of equation are shown on the right. And there are some important assumptions. One assumption is that there's no aseismic slip. That strain on the entire fault zone is released during an earthquake. And another one assumption is that each earthquake releases all of the accumulated elastic strain. Um, so the results uh, estimating the time it takes to create enough you know, strain to produce magnitude 5 to 7.5 uh, earthquakes is shown here. So we've got magnitude of earthquake on the x-axis and strain accumulation time in years on the y-axis. I'm doing it on a log plot here for this sort of zoomed, zoomed in area because it's kind of hard to read the lines exactly where they are for these lower magnitudes. What the results are telling us is that if the Saddle Mountains and Decline and other faults in the Yakima Fold province accommodate magnitude 5 to 6.5 earthquakes, we would be seeing them every several years to every, you know, perhaps 100 years. We don't see those in the seismic catalog or in history necessarily. Um, but the results also would suggest that if those smaller magnitude earthquakes, which are still damaging, but if, if the, the earthquakes in this region tend to be a bit bigger, they would take longer um, on the 100 to perhaps 10,000 year time scale 
to accumulate enough strain energy to release an earthquake of that magnitude. So from this data set or this estimate and what we see in the seismic catalogs, um, we would suggest that the Yakima faults uh, accumulate strain fairly slowly um, and hold on to it and have the potential to uh, create magnitude, um, let's say high sixes to sevens on 100 to 1,000 year time scales. So that's a possibility. But again, with some of those assumptions um, in mind. Another thing we want to address is why we're seeing this increase in the deformation rate in the Yakima Fold province. Um, we think that this is a re regional increase. And again, one of the major players in the whole system in creating all this deformation is the, the Cascadia subduction zone. So my co-authors and I were wondering if there could be something, some changes along the subduction zone that could incite this regional increase in, in deformation rate in the back arc. I can simplify this image to show um, deformation as a series of vectors. So the whole system is responding to um, subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate relative to stable North America, which is pinned over here somewhere. We've got a lot of deformation in the overriding plate, um, which is represented by this vector here. And we have deformation accommodated along, along the subducting plate interface represented by this vector here. All of these vectors more or less have to add up to each other. So deformation along the plate interface, in addition to deformation of the upper plate, more or less have to add up to the plate convergence rate, right? So our question is, how can we, or do there evidence for changes along the plate interface um, causing this vector over here to increase sometime in Pliocene or Pleistocene time? There's a few ways we could think about doing this. One way to increase this vector here is to increase the overall rate of convergence. We don't necessarily see that, however. In fact, we would expect a decrease because you're subducting younger and younger lithosphere as time goes on. So that's not likely um, and isn't borne out in the um, marine magnetic anomaly data sets either. Another way to increase that vector is to increase the obliquity of subduction. So if you have a greater northward component to the, the overall subduction uh, convergence rate and an azimuth, that may uh, relate to uplift um, and deformation being a little bit higher in the overriding plate. But again, from magnetic anomaly data sets, we're really not seeing that happening along the plate um, on the, along the subduction zone itself. Another possibility, which we think is perhaps a more likely one, is that there is an increase in the strain or in the slip partitioning um, along the, along the um, subducting plate interface. So if the plate interface takes less of that northward oblique convergence, then that northward component has to be going into the overriding plate essentially. And we think that there is actually some evidence for this happening um, and changing in, in Pliocene and Pleistocene time. So there's some evidence from magnetic anomalies in the Explorer plate, which is part of the Juan Fuca system to the north, that it began to move independently from the Juan de Fuca plate, sometime starting around three to four million years ago and stabilizing about 2.4 million years ago. As they start to, as these two microplates start to move independently, then there's a possibility of a slab tear opening up between the two plates. There are some interesting volcanic compositions along the Garibaldi volcanic belt here that indicate that there's a northward increase in the component, in the component of primitive asthenospheric melt. In addition, there's some shear wave splitting and seismic anisotropy measurements that show that a lot of the flow of, of the mantle un, over, under North America, um, under the Pacific Northwest in the forearc, but over the um, subducting plate is actually moving in a north-south fashion. So these are anisotropy measurements uh, shown as these dashed lines. Since you can see there's a lot of north-south movement in the forearc here. This is relatively recently published. Um, and from uh, in cross-section view, these are a couple of cross-sections, A to, a to C I'm showing over here. And uh, this is showing fast velocity direction. 90 degrees is basically north-south. And you can see that there's relatively north-south oriented anisotropy in, in this portion of the mantle wedge too. So what this may suggest is that about two, to, uh, sorry, three to four million years ago when the explorer plate started to move independently, it may have opened up a little bit of a slab tear between it and the um, adjacent one to Fuku plate. If there is toroidal ascenospheric flow, then it would explain that northward increase of um, primitive ascenospheric melt in the Garibaldi volcanic belt 
And it would also explain that north-south um, direction underneath the forearc of the, um, that we see in the anisotropy and shear wave splitting. If this started in the Pliocene or Pleistocene, that, uh, that toroidal flow and southward directed flow may suppress the northward component of oblique subduction that's resolved about around or on, top, on the plate interface itself. That residual northward motion has to go somewhere, and we suggest that it may have gone into upper plate deformation and increased the north south uh, shortening in the Yakima Fool province. So, just to sum up and give a little bit of time for questions, I hope. Um, in this work, in these couple studies, we've used geomorphic, geologic, and geophysical analyses to constrain crustal structure, deformation rates, and seismic hazard in Washington. We're seeing a rate increase some time in Pliocene or Pleistocene time, um, well constrained along the Yakima Canyon region, a little less constrained on exactly when that happened in the Saddle Mountains and Decline region. The slip rates are, about, are in the Yakima Canyon region are about 0.35 to 0.64 millimeters per year. And the minimum estimate from the Saddle Mountains and Decline is a bit less, closer to point, you know, 1 point, point, point 0.1, point 0.2. We suggest, based on our seismic hazard, hazard analysis, that earthquakes of fairly moderate to large magnitude earthquakes could be happening in this region. We haven't seen one yet, but it could happen. And there's a lot of infrastructure in the region to pay attention to. And one of the more arm-waving but interesting uh, suggestions is that from this work is that the regional acceleration in the deformations rates that we're seeing is perhaps related to a slab tear um, along uh, the Juan de Fuca and Explorer plates that started maybe three to four million years ago. And that's it.